Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of eSig. I wanna welcome you to our 2022 eSig monthly webinar series and give you a little bit of background on eSig. For those of you not familiar with eSig, we're a membership-based nonprofit organization providing our members with objective information, resources, and networking opportunities in support of the energy transition. We do this through workshops, tutorials, webinars, blogs, working group and task force activities, and producing technical resource materials. I also serve in a leadership role with the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, the GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze a rapid, clean energy transition at unprecedented scope and speed. ESIG leads pillar one of the five pillars, which deals with the research agenda for the system operators. More information on the GPST can be found at globalpst.org. We've been quite busy in the new year, getting some new projects off the ground and preparing for our spring technical workshop, which will be held in Tucson in two weeks. We were a little wary of the COVID derailing things as it has done in the past, but we're glad to report that we will be back in person for the spring meeting. Further information about the meeting is available on our website. Our workshops and monthly webinars are open to everyone, so please feel free to register anytime on the eSig website. If you're new to eSig, I strongly encourage you to follow up with us if you like what you hear, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. eSig membership will give you an opportunity to participate actively in all of our working groups and task forces. You can find us on the web at eSig.energy, as well as on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Okay, just a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. For the Q&A, we're using the Slido platform. So to ask your questions, please go to slido.com and enter eSig9 as the event code. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the questions to allow you to cast a vote to help prioritize the questions submitted. We plan to save 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A at the end and then wrap it up at the top of the hour. An email with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar. So please don't be afraid to ask your questions through Slido. Today's topic will be on the Universal Interoperability for Grid Forming Inverters Project, or UNIFI for short. This is a project co-led by NREL, EPRI, and the University of Washington. It's funded by the Solar Energy Technology Office, or CEDO, at DOE, at the level of $25 million over five years. The project is aligned with the goals of the GPST, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago. Pillar one of the GPST deals with the research agenda of the founding system operators. The UNIFI project is focused on the research questions having to do with grid forming inverters. The project is just getting off the ground and here to tell us about it is Ben Kropowski, the director of the Power Systems Engineering Center at NREL. I feel very fortunate to have Ben here with us today. Ben is both a professional colleague and a good friend. We have worked together on renewable integration activities for the last 15 years, both of us serving as guest editors for different renewable integration issues of the IEEE P&E magazine during much of that time. Ben has nearly 30 years of experience in dealing with the integration of renewables in the planning, design, and operation of power systems, and is an internationally recognized expert in this area. We have 117 common connections on LinkedIn, working with many of the same people over the years. I consider Ben a good friend and a good friend of eSig, and it's a pleasure working with him. This webinar will discuss the overall goals of the UNIFI Consortium and its plans to develop interoperability guidelines and functional specifications. The purpose of this is to enable power systems to operate with any mix of synchronous machines and inverter-based resources at any scale in an affordable, reliable, and sustainable manner. I greatly value Ben's contributions to eSig and the industry, and I look forward to what he has to say. Just a short reminder once again to use Slido at slido.com with the event code of eSig9 to ask your questions. Okay, 
without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Ben, I'll now turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Charlie. Appreciate the introduction and thank you for having me here this afternoon to talk about the Unify Consortium. So, what are we talking about when we talk about the Unify Consortium? As Charlie mentioned, this is a new effort that is really focused around how to integrate large amounts of inverter-based resources into electric power grids. We see really the future power system being this thing that integrates any mix of machines, synchronous machines, synchronous generators, and inverter-based resources at any scale to create this affordable, secure, reliable, clean, and resilient energy future. If you take a look at the graph over to the right, this is showing basically system size along the x-axis and percent wind and solar, which are inverter-based resources in the y-axis. As you can see, uh, several levels of renewables uh, deployed in each of these grids. Two things to note, uh, the squares represent the instantaneous power level, so any particular point in time, and the circles represent annual energy from wind and solar. Um, you can also note that uh, at the small end of these systems, these are small island grid power grids, we really know how to operate these very well at high levels of renewables. But as we get larger and larger systems, um, there are technical challenges that need to be addressed in order to allow for inverter-based resources to be deployed at scale. And we really see that the Unify Consortium is this uh, type of a forum that is specifically addressing the fundamental challenges of seamlessly integrating grid-forming technologies into power systems of the future. And what we're trying to do basically is bend this curve, if you will, that you see highlighted here, and take that so that even at the largest power grids, we can solve, uh, come up with solutions for enabling them to instantaneously run at extremely high levels, close to 100% instantaneous for inverter-based resources. So Unify really is gonna focus on conducting the research and development, demonstrating concepts at scale, authoring best practices and standards, and training the next generation workforce to meet these goals. Also, we see this really as the most critical problem to solve to enable high levels of wind, solar, batteries integrated into electric power systems. If we can get this particular piece of the problem solved, this will uh, enable rapid deployment of wind and solar and other inverter-based resource technologies. So what's happening in this space right now? So there is a lot of work going around, uh, on around the world. As Charlie mentioned, mentioned, the Global Power System Transformation Initiative that's happening is working with countries from around the world to uh, move the entire world toward these sustainable energy goals. And specifically, there are lots of grid codes around inverter-based resources. But the challenge right now is uh, around grid forming capable inverter based resources um, and defining what these will be doing in the future. So a lot of work has been done in the United States laying out research roadmaps uh, for the grid forming inverters. This was done with the help of the Department of Energy Solar Energy Technology Office. Um, some other examples, both the uh, NSOE um, in Europe uh, and National Grid in the UK are developing grid codes in this area, and AEMO in Australia are looking at this. But in general, if you take a look, lots of great ideas moving forward, but we really haven't sat down and figured out a way to standardize all of this um, great work. So that's really what we're trying to focus on inside this consortium is come up with a way to integrate both the vendors and manufacturers of these inverter-based technologies along with the utilities and system operators to make sure that we're developing a consistent set of um, codes or rules or specifications, if you will, that will enable us to address this challenge. So if we think about how the power system evolved in the past, uh, a lot of it involved uh, with the development of synchronous generators, and there was a lot of work on developing how to make these synchronous generators 
become interoperable with each other just using the physics of those technologies. When we look at inverters, we have control algorithms that are embedded inside these technologies that actually dictate how they work. And really, we need to focus on how to make uh, synchronous generators, inverter-based technologies, and the grid forming capabilities all work cohesively. So again, the Unified Consortium really is focused on the challenge of seamless integration of grid forming technologies into electric power systems of the future. We want to bring the industry together to unify the integration uh, and operation of inverter-based resources and synchronous machines. We have three major uh, focuses, if you look on the far right-hand side. So a component around research and development, um, specifically you know, new models or control algorithms that need to be developed in this space, uh, a demonstration and commercialization effort, and an outreach and training effort. And I'll go through all of this in much more detail. As Charlie mentioned, this is initially a five-year project that is uh, funded from the Department of Energy and also co-funded from a number of the partners on this project with the idea that we would make this organization sustainable through memberships, and I'll highlight that at the very end. So if we take a look at what we're trying to develop here, this is a, a picture of our Envision system architecture. If we start off with the actual grid forming inverter technologies themselves, so they're highlighted here in the yellow and orange areas, whether it's an individual large scale inverter, whether it's a plant that's integrating multiples of these to create a large scale uh, plant, or whether there are aggregations that are uh, geographically spread, we need each of those um, kind of configurations to be able to have a set of integrated functions. And so you can see the call out where it's talked about uh, unit level advances. So we need some standardization really on how the signals are flowing in and out of these devices, as well as the actual controls and functions that are being implemented inside the technologies. And then at the systems level, the operator, um, which is doing high-level controls, how they're passing potentially uh, balancing signals and other types of information down to the range of inverter technologies. So we're looking at how do we standardize not only the functional requirements that are built into the inverters, but also the system level guidelines um, and what types of signal input and output need to be defined to allow this to happen uh, efficiently. And at the end of the day, there will be a lot of advances both at the unit level with the inverters as well as at the system level to enable this to seamlessly operate. So one of our big goals is really to come up with what we're terming unified specifications. And these really are the way to standardize the performance and benchmark the capabilities of these grid forming technologies both at the systems level, so whatever the operator needs to ensure uh, stable and reliable power grids, as well as at the inverter level, so the functional requirements that really define how an inverter will respond to conditions on the grid and um, be able to accurately respond to those, such that the system operators have a good understanding of the response characteristics. Unify will focus around convening this continuous collaboration between the inverter manufacturers on one end and the system operators and utilities on the other to bridge the gap between the power systems world and the power electronic industries. And really what we want to do is cultivate a inclusive um, um, uh, culture that really is going to leverage member cooperation so that we can sustain innovation in this space. So where are we right now? So we actually started this process a little over a year ago when the Department of Energy announced a funding opportunity to form a grid uh, forming inverter consortium. We submitted a proposal in April of 2021. Um, the award was announced in August of 2021. And then um, we spent uh, a little bit of time, six months, putting together the, the complete five-year statement of work that's going to be accomplished in this time frame. And then we've been working with each of our partners on the project to develop the individual statements of work that they'll be doing. 
But the most important piece here is that January 2022, earlier this year, Unify has officially kicked off and started. This is a glance at the organizational structure. So as Charlie mentioned, it's co-led by NREL, the University of Washington, and EPRI. We have a set of uh, internal leadership team with a lot of experience dealing with uh, consortiums and other things in the um, energy sector. Um, and then, as you can see, as this splits out, we have these three major uh, areas. So research and development, commercialization and demonstration, and outreach and training. And you can see the sub-bullets in there. I'll go through some of these areas today, um, but realize that this is a continual um, um, migrating process. We're kicking off a lot of work as we speak in these areas. But over time and over the five-year time frame, we'll be migrating a lot of this work uh, from the research and development areas more toward commercialization and demonstration, and then taking a lot of this information and pushing it to the outreach and training sectors. So inside of this area, we have set up several working groups. I'll uh, list them up here and mention a couple of them. But as you can see, what we're very focused on is having smaller groups that are defining different parts of this uh, large-scale project. So for example, the first one listed on here is really very focused on developing these specifications, uh, defining the rules, also understanding what type of IP potentially is um, associated with meeting these requirements. And then there's a variety of other working groups that map to a lot of the areas mentioned um, before. And I'll go through a little bit more detail on specifically what's getting done in some of these areas. But this is just to give you an idea that we're developing these working groups that are gonna spend time um, and effort really um, uh, defining a lot of these type of issues and coming up with solutions that we can then validate in the field. So this is the current member or the project team. All of these people um, currently right now are either getting DOE funds or providing cost share into this particular project. You can see that it covers a wide range of players in this field from national labs and research laboratories to the uh, large set of universities that we have involved on this. And then on the bottom side, the industry players, whether they're the vendors and developers of inverter-based technologies or hardware in the loop simulation technologies, to the utilities and system operators that'll see these types of systems uh, deployed on their power grids. And one of the things that we're very focused on is how to make sure that we can get a lot of this information um, uh, made available in such a way that a lot of the utilities can start specifying uh, the use of grid forming technologies and the vendors can start building product to meet those specifications as quickly as possible. We also have a set of additional partners that you can see here that range from additional utilities and consultants to additional inverter vendors, um, a lot of the software platform vendors that are in the power system space are connected on this as well as additional system operators. Finally, I'll mention the other consortia that exists over to the right-hand side of this particular graph, including things like eSIG, which is you know, the member-driven effort to really focus on energy systems integration, and things like the Global Power System Transformation Consortium. But uh, this enables us to basically share a lot of information across all of these players to, to move the entire industry forward. So now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time and go into a little more detail into some of these technical areas. We'll first start off with the R&D area. And as you can see, um, this covers modeling and simulation, controls, hardware, and integration and validation. So um, going a little deeper into the modeling and simulation area, there's a lot of work right now being done in how to accurately model and simulate grid forming technologies. The biggest challenge there is the, the range of products that you have that go across modeling and simulation um, all the way from extremely fast, say, pulse width modulating switching models to EMT type models all the way up to more steady state and aggregate models. 
And what we want to do inside the consortium is look at how we can develop ideas around making these models more interoperable with each other, making sure that you can pass models between uh, platforms and that they can also be used between um, actual 100% pure simulation models and high uh, hardware in the loop simulation type technologies. So we really want to drive the use of these um, platforms so that we can standardize on how to model grid forming technologies. That's really one of the key things when we think about large scale deployments you're going to need to be able to model um, large scale power grids with lots of these systems embedded in them. We're also working on basically developing case studies and interoperability tests that would enable these models uh, to work together. And we've got partnerships and collaborations with all the commercial power system simulation vendors and are bringing them into the process of trying to make sure that we can standardize on uh, sets of models in this area. In the control space, we're looking at, again, how to focus in on developing controls both at the inverter layer and level as well as the system-wide or grid level. So. The system operators are typically going to have some set of control signals that they send out to power plants, something like that would be close to automatic generator control or AGC. But how do you start to do that for lots of distributed devices and how do you make sure that uh, inverter-based technologies are responding properly to these system level signals? And then inside the inverter themselves, there's going to be autonomous primary controls going on in there, and we want to make sure that those are, um, you know, making very quick decisions and, and um, accurately responding to a variety of different grid conditions. In the integration and validation area, this is where we're um, taking a lot of the capabilities that we have across our partner teams to um, come up with ways of doing standardized testing across the grid forming capabilities. So the things that we want to look at there is coming up with standardized testing protocol that can then be evaluated so that people can validate that their grid forming technology does what it says it's going to do. And this would include evaluations of the control layers because there's many different ways that you can deploy grid forming controls um, that are currently available and that will be developed into the future. We also want to be able to make sure that we can test uh, various communication layers so that we can ensure that you're developing a cyber secure method for passing signals between devices. And then an emulation layer that marries some of the modeling and simulation work with the actual hardware testing that can be done in order to demonstrate that these um, products really are doing what they're saying and that you can back validate the models and simulations. Included in this area in our plans is a large scale experiment, um, all, uh, roughly a megawatt with multiple different vendors uh, that will be deployed at our energy systems integration facility at NREL. And what we're planning on doing is setting up this particular um, test bed so that you can uh, bring grid forming equipment in that is designed to meet the specifications and allow them to interact with other vendors to ensure that they're interoperable between them on a hardware and power system and power sharing level. We're going to include a variety of different physical sizes, uh, different single and three phase applications, hopefully multiple source side resources, and look at a variety of different levels of grid forming technology along with things like grid following inverters and with synchronous generators. So how that mix all ties together. And we're looking at how to make this sort of a replicable situation where multiple labs could set up these type of capabilities. So as we move on to the demonstration and commercialization area, I'll uh, just highlight what's included in here. It includes a 20 megawatt demonstration. Um, we also embed our IP management and domestic product development in this area, as well as the standards work. And this is where we're trying to take a lot of the research that's being done and making sure that uh, you can commercialize this at a scale and demonstrate that it works accurately. So 
So um, a piece that I'll highlight here is the 20 megawatt demonstration. We're actually working with several of our partners right now to identify one or more sites that potentially could host a large scale demonstration. So we're looking at things um, that range from places where we would have a lot of controllability. You can imagine a merchant, large scale merchant plant uh, that has potentially multiple different types of inverters and even multiple different types of technologies from PV systems to batteries to wind turbines, all the way to very diverse sites um, and these may be scattered around um, more um, uh, residential or commercial areas where you have a mix of different manufacturers and technologies. So we're evaluating a variety of different sites. Our goal is to have uh, one or more of these demonstrations completed by the end of the five-year project. Of course, we'd like to, to get it moving earlier to demonstrate that if you can follow the specifications that these grid forming technologies really add value to the grid and therefore will be deployed a lot more. So what we're looking for are sites that uh, may include some or all of the following over here on the left side, a mix of three phase or single phase resources, a mix of grid forming inverters, grid following inverters, synchronous machines if available. Uh, devices that may have a wide range of power ratings from 250 watts, which are very tiny things up into the megawatt class scale. Multiple solutions from uh, a variety of vendors because we want to make sure that as long as vendors are sort of following the specifications that they'll all work together. Um, and then a variety of different loads and controls. Um, at the end of the day, we're trying to validate the interoperability between the devices and how they scale the control algorithms inside of these units, how they do power sharing. Uh, Black Start is going to be coming an increasingly important uh, contribution from grid forming technologies, how they respond to transients, um, and how to actually achieve 100% inverter based operation with really large scale power grids. So if you have potential demonstration sites and haven't been in touch with us, please reach out and um, have a conversation with us on that. Some work that we've done in the past, if you're not that familiar with it, uh, uh, NREL led several de um, demonstration deployments. So working with both uh, vendors and utilities, we're able to demonstrate that inverter-based resources had a large number of capabilities to ensure essential reliability services. I'll just highlight one here, which was looking at a 300 megawatt solar power plant in California, where the researchers were able to uh, work with the actual system developer, demonstrate these type of advanced controls that inverter-based resources could actually provide things like following automatic generator control signals or providing fast up and down voltage regulation services. As we migrate from the development of the work that's being done under this project, most likely some type of IP will get developed in this space and we're working with understanding how to characterize that with a set of what we're calling core stack IP. The idea around this is really just to identify the, the minimum set of uh, information and IP that could be developed uh, that would enable uh, grid forming technologies to meet these interoperability guidelines and functional requirements. There may be more than one way to do it, but what we want to ensure here is that there is a path for people to make, make technologies that meet all of these requirements um, and would be available to the members inside the consortium. And then longer term, our idea is to migrate a lot of this information into the standards realm. Uh, for people that have worked on standards, things like IEEE 1547 at the distribution level and uh, P2800 at the transmission level, these standards take quite an effort to move forward and really um, move forward once there's a lot of work and understanding of what needs to get done. And so this standings are pretty much a, a lagging indicator of where the industry is, meaning that by the time standards are developed, the technology has gone through its paces and been developed so that you can standardize it. What we really see is that working with the IEEE and these working groups, we can take a lot of the information that we develop under this project and push it out to these standards eventually 
in such a way that um, this type of information will become readily available and standardized across the industry. So we have very close working relationships with these standard development organizations. Um, moving on to the outreach and training area. So we, inside of this, we have education, workforce development, uh, communications and events. Uh, just to highlight, uh, we are kicking off our in-person events for the Unify Consortium in uh, conjunction with the IEEE Power and Energy Society General Meeting in Denver in July, which uh, looks to be a great event. Of course, I'm out in Denver right now and would encourage everyone to attend in person, finally, the uh, next IEEE Power and Energy General Meeting. Um, but we're looking for ways of actually getting the word out about, about what we're doing in the grid forming inverter space and how to develop material to really train the next generation workforce. Those, that will be um, absolutely necessary as the entire power system is about to go uh, through a significant change in terms of the resources that are embedded in it. So we look at, um, are looking at developing things like industry-led training events how to model and simulate these type of grids, how to actually install and operate hardware. We're also looking at maybe potentially interoperability events, uh, things like the solar decathlon, if you're familiar with that, where they build all of these tiny solar homes and they bring them together and demonstrate that these technologies can work seamlessly together. Uh, we'll probably be doing future workshops in this area. You can see one from uh, a couple of years back that we had that are kind of initially kicked off the grid forming inverter space at the University of Washington. And then we want to leverage a lot of our existing partnerships between members and um, ways of getting the word out about how the power system is about to change and making sure that we're ready to handle that and developing the materials that will be necessary in this area. So along those lines, I did want to highlight that we are currently also running a seminar series. It's called the Unify Seminar Series. This actually runs every Monday, so a weekly event. Uh, 15 seminars in the spring and 15 seminars in the fall. Uh, we did uh, a set last fall and we're currently in the middle of our spring seminar series. Uh, for the next five years, we plan to hold this time uh, slot so that you can kind of pre-plan to attend these meetings. We are recording these meetings and they'll be available on our website once we get the website uh, stood up. If you need, if you're not connected with these and wanna join these uh, webinars, please reach out to me and we can get you connected into these. But um, also a very good event where we are very focused on highlighting and discussing grid forming technologies. Okay, so moving forward in this area, uh, how would you get involved with Unify if you're interested? So we are currently setting up a membership structure um, and that would allow organizations to join that weren't part of the original project team. The benefits around this really are access to the working groups, participating in the development of the grid forming and interoperability specifications, access to experts at, on grid forming technologies, and access to the education and workforce development material. These are gonna be key as we think about how to um, connect people into these uh, systems um, and how we train people into the future to operate these grids. So I'll just flash up here quickly the membership levels and the various benefits, but uh, all of this will eventually be up on our website where we'll have it available and you can uh, look into this. Again, if you're interested, please give me um, send me an email and, and we can get the conversation started. And again, this is really driven around moving the industry forward. So we're trying to get a large number of the vendors, utility system operators, all working together to come up with sort of these specifications that will drive the industry, uh, get us to a point where this could move towards standardization. Um, being a member will allow you to have access to the core stack IP as it's developed through this program um, and also participation in the uh, demonstrations that are connected. We also, through our universities, are, have a wide student pool that will be entering the workforce, all trained on grid forming technologies. And another thing that we wanna make sure is we'll have plenty of events over the next several years that will allow access 
to the students, to the researchers to get better understanding of the work that's going on in this area. So uh, our website's currently under development, but it'll probably be up here in the next month. Um, and uh, you can also follow our information on LinkedIn, check for the Unify Consortium Group, and we'll be posting information on that site. So for more information, you can talk, contact myself, the Unify Organizational Director, or Iqbal Hussein at NC State, who is our Sustainability Officer, and we can help uh, get you plugged into this organization. And with that, I'll wrap up and say thank you, and we can start to take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ben. We've got a uh, fair number of questions that have, that have <coughs> come in. I'll, uh, Take a look on the Slido here and kind of go down the, the list. Our top question here is uh, from Steve Drule. Do you envision all IBR eventually being grid forming? Will it be a requirement? How will equipment owners be compensated for providing this added capability? Yep. Um, so the, that's a good question. I mean, right now, um, we could, we could envision systems where not all of the inverters are grid forming. Um, in fact, we've done studies in the past, either us or our, the partners on this particular project have looked at that and um, come, to, come to the determination that you don't always need all of your resources to be grid forming. Now, if the uh, inverter manufacturers design their systems in such a way that you know, they can switch between grid forming and grid following very easy. It's all built into their uh, future products. Then maybe they all eventually do have that capability and become grid forming. But I would say in terms of overall system operation, it's not a necessity. But to reach these high levels, say above uh, 75 to 100 um, percent levels of wind and solar, you, you are going to need some amount of grid forming capability uh, to handle all the, the typical um, issues that you would see on normal power grids. Um, Charlie, I'm not sure I remember the rest of that question. It seemed like a second part. <laughs> well, will they all be grid forming? Will it be a requirement and how will they get compensated? Yeah, oh, the compensation piece. Um, so I don't know that it'll be a, a requirement per se. You'll have to evaluate your systems and see what portion of of your of your inverters actually need to have the grid forming capability. And I, there will need to be a lot of discussion on how they get compensated for that capability, whether it's being compensated as a black start resource or being compensated for uh, providing um, the essential reliability services necessary to support the grid. Uh, those are good discussions that I think uh, the industry needs to have about how to compensate uh, for those techno for that feature set. Yeah, just to add a little uh, additional background uh, to that one, there's basically two ways that's gone for other such requirements in different markets around the world. In some places, they're grid codes and you can't um, interconnect to the system unless you meet the grid code. And in other places, they're they're market-driven requirements, and there's markets set up to compensate for specific features. So, I suspect there'll be kind of elements of both going forward. Yep, agreed. Okay, uh, next question here from some enterprising fellow: <laughs> Are there any hardware or sensor or di digital signal processing improvements you would like to see beyond what the market currently provides? To enable or enhance GFM inverters. Um, sure, at, you know, at a high level, you you still need to have platforms that embed, embed a lot of the controls that I was talking about to enable grid forming capability. I really didn't get into any of the details of how you do that. There's a number of ways of how you build inverters that have those uh, controls built in, but you know, the more standardization around the actual DSPs or control codes and chips that are embedded in these devices, you know, the more standardization around that, um, probably the better to understand how these devices are going to react to grid disturbances. 
So there's space in there. Um, obviously, all the vendors have their products in that area, and new and up and coming vendors um, could develop products that meet those specifications. Um, so there's a lot in that which, which revolve around, if you want to call it the brain of how it does the grid forming capabilities and meet the requirements. And there's also the pieces of understanding better what's happening on the grid and relaying that information to either the system operator level or to um, say some distributed controls that are embedded in the, in the system itself. So it's always better if you can actually see what's going on on the grid. I think in a lot of ways there's a lot of challenges in that space of building better sensing and measurement at a cheap enough cost to give us a good visibility of what's happening on the grid system. Okay, here's one about uh, standardization, Ben, kind of looking forward, the big picture. Are you intending to develop a U.S. standard or global standard? How are you engaging with other international approaches? Um, so, at first, I, I would say the way these things usually work, um, and I've been involved with the development of standards for probably uh, close to 30 years, um, there's a lot of people developing their own individual standards because they have the, the, the need to do it. All of a sudden, they have to deal with it. They have to put together some level of standards. So that is also where we are in this space, I feel, which is there are, there are entities around the world um, doing individually coming up with sort of requirements for grid forming technologies. And we plan to do the same inside of Unify, although I would say the one leg up we have is that we actually have access to a lot of those organizations that are actively working on this. So you saw a lot of the partners that are connected to this project around the world, not just in the United States. That being said, we want to make sure that we develop requirements that are useful around the entire world and whether they're, whether they're eventually implemented in a U.S. standard, like an IEEE standard, or an I, uh, internationally like an IEC standard, the, the, the base information needs to be roughly the same because the vendors are global players and they're selling product around the world. You, you know, you have to change from 50 to 60 hertz, but aside from that, you're basically selling the same products that are going to have the same functionality to enable proper op, uh, grid operations. So again, a key there is making sure that as these um, specific specifications are developed, that people start to take a look at them, get experience with them, and understand how to move them forward in a cohesive way, because eventually you'll need to make a uh, product that, that goes everywhere in the world. Ben, there's a related question further down, uh, asking whether, whether you see IEEE 1547 and 2800 evolving to address grid forming, or do you see new standards coming? Well, um, we don't really know, we don't know today where that path is going to go, but if I had to guess, I would say our, our initial path would be to update 1547 and 2800. Both, of, um, especially for people that aren't familiar with 1547, you know, it was started in 1999 and the first uh, version was published in 2003. It went through many small upgrades between then and a major upgrade in 2018. So standards are not fixed um, documents. They are always trying to keep up with the current state of the art. The, the challenge is they're several, usually several years behind where the industry is. But uh, that's why I think that eventually those standards will be upgraded to include grid forming uh, requirements. Okay. Uh, kind of a related question for software. Are you considering open source software for modeling and simulation of power systems with IBR? And can this help in transitioning to a universal standard, software standard, I would guess? Yes. Yep. So we are looking at both, we're evaluating both open source software modeling um, as, this, as this information is developed, as well as open source software codes that are the things that are embedded inside inverters. Um, initially, it may take a while to get that out the door, but um, 
I think that eventually you'll see some of some of those products come out that um, are open sourced. Again, individual vendors are are going to probably have proprietary code for both uh, both modeling and simulation and for control code, but they at the end of the day, they, it would be helpful if their response characteristics are the things that get standardized. And that really is what we want to make sure that to enable is from a utility perspective, they know what the inverters are going to do uh, to various um, uh, events that happen on the grid. Okay. Um, question from a, a PhD student, and I would imagine there's a number of them participating in the webinar today. How can PhD students around the world participate in your work? Um, well, the first thing is you can join up for the seminar series. That is open to everyone. It is uh, publicly available and freely available. Number two, we will be making um, a good portion of what we're working on publicly available, and that will eventually migrate to our website so that you can find out more information on, on those type of activities. So the, the best way I would say to, for like students around the world that are interested in this area, the best way to keep current of what's happening is to attend those Unify seminars, because that's happening basically every week to find out the latest and greatest of what's going on. And then as we publicly publish information, it'll all be available. That won't be everything, but it'll be um, a good portion of some of the stuff that we do. Okay, uh, question on offshore wind. Uh, how much focus does Unify Consortium dedicate to offshore wind and do you have any uh, kind of resource materials? Um, I would say at this point in time, we haven't necessarily called out offshore wind. We are trying to really focus on making everything that we do technology or agnostic. So when we are talking about grid forming inverters, that would include wind turbines onshore and offshore would include uh, PV systems, would include battery systems, would even include uh, HVDC or HVDC light, anything that's, that's got that grid forming capability. So it's not, uh, I don't think we have uh, spent the time to try to differentiate uh, applications of the various grid forming technologies. We want to see if we can come up with a set of uh, requirements that would be implementable, whether it's onshore, offshore, or uh, those variety of technologies. Okay, uh, here's a question on uh, the evolution of things. How do you think IBR retrofit will progress? Large DC interconnectors down to small PV with locational provision of inertia, phase jump, and damping correction? Um, I guess that's assuming to begin with that there will be IBR retrofit. Uh, I think that there will be some level of IBR retrofits, but of course it really it highly depends on the, the hardware platforms and the firmware platforms that are embedded in these existing systems. We, you know, um, the, the newer the inverter, the more likely it's gonna have the capability to be retrofit with a variety of grid forming capabilities. Much older inverters probably aren't gonna necessarily have that capability and are going to be much harder to retrofit. And it, it may come that it's just cheaper uh, to do a full replacement of the inverters. Now, when you're talking about back-to-back -back DC inner ties, those are much more expensive than um, inverters on PV systems or wind turbines. And it uh, depends on, on the age of those and the replacement capabilities. Again, I think this is a process that's going to unfold over the next decade or two as we migrate to these much higher levels. Initially, we'll try to push how much wind and solar we get into the grid. You know, currently we're hitting in spots in the United States, as I just, I just saw over the weekend, SPP, Southwest Power Pool in the U.S., was up at 75% wind and having to curtail. Um, so 
we're starting to hit those even on really large scale grids in the U.S. right now, and we'll, we'll continue to see that over the next several years. So it'll be increasingly important that, that as we think about deploying the next generation of, of grids uh, and resources that they have some of these grid forming capabilities. Okay, here's a question that comes up uh, fairly often now, Ben. Do you see a role for distributed or centralized real physical inertia in facilitating the stable control of 100% renewable grids? Uh, yes, <laughs> will be the quick answer. There's a role for it. We do need, that's obviously if we're replacing um, large uh, bulk sy uh, system or uh, synchronous generators with inverter-based resources, we are at a minimum going to need most of these resources to have some level of fast frequency response to ride through system-wide disturbances. The challenge will be how do you, um, actually understand the how much inertia you need on the grid. I, I think if we are dealing with uh, a synchronous uh, generator-based grid, we have a good understanding of what are strong and weak grids and how much inertia is required to keep those operationally stable. But as we migrate to many more inverters, does the and, and we program them with the correct fast frequency response, um, that doesn't really show up as inertia anymore in inertia calculations, but there is devices out there that's providing some level of, of fast reaction. So, um, in general, once we start to push these high levels, you do need to make sure that the system is going to maintain stability under a variety of contingency conditions. I think right now we can do a lot of understanding both um, in modeling and simulation, but the biggest challenges are accurately modeling and simulating inverter-based resources and specifically grid-forming uh, resources and how they react to those um, contingency events. Okay, I'm going to take two questions here that were together, I think, when they were submitted, but they've uh, separated a little bit. One, uh, could you amplify what is meant by dynamic phasers? And the related question was, could you discuss the application of synchrophasers in providing control stability between uh, GFMs? Um, well, let me take the second part first, because I can probably answer that one better than the first one, which um, revolves around the use of synchrophasers. I mean, obviously, if we deploy better sensing devices in the grid, um, and so PMUs or micro PMUs, um, are, are sensing devices that give us highly accurate information on voltage, frequency, phase angles, all these um, characteristics of the grid. That's going to give us a better understanding from a system-wide perspective of, of what's happening in the grid itself. And you could then translate that information relatively quickly to pushing uh, signals out to maintain operational stability across grids. At the same time, though, there, you, you're going to need to still embed autonomous uh, reactions in your inverter-based resources. They can't just fly by waiting for signals uh, from a controller. That's going to be too slow for protection events or very fast uh, frequency swings and things like that. So each of the inverters is still going to have a set of autonomous controls that it's going to have to be making decisions with local voltage and frequency measurements. Um, use of synchrophasers would add to that um, capability for longer term uh, reliability of the system and to give you a better perspective of what's going on across larger balancing areas because you can tie all that information together. Uh, dynamic phasers, I think you were talking about I believe that's on like the modeling and simulation slide, uh, if I remember correctly, and that revolves mostly around being able to accurately model um, these inverter-based resources that actually have um, the ability. That's what, what makes them so challenging is that their their char operational characteristics are dictated by the control algorithms inside of them, and you can program them to. Um, 
again, have different operational characteristics. So it's this uh, chicken and egg of how, of what kind of controls you build into your inverters and how well you can model the reaction of those controls to uh, disturbance events. Okay. Um, kind of a detailed question here, Ben. Can you comment on the differences of grid forming inverters in terms of control and stability between distribution systems and transmission systems? Um, you know, in general, I'll just say that uh, when we think about the way distribution and transmission systems are set up, historically, uh, and this is why we kind of have two different standards in the U.S., that we want transmission equipment because it's mostly really big pieces of generation to act in a certain way to maintain the overall grid stability. And historically, in the distribution uh, sense, we've um, designed the distribution systems to not have a lot of generation embedded in it. So typically, we don't you know, historically, we consider those operations a little differently than how a transmission system um, interconnected generator would work. But it, I think we're starting to see the merging of these two areas. Um, when we first had 1547, right, we, we were saying we want to enable the grid to be stable. We want the distributed generators to come offline quickly. Um, and stay offline until the events were fixed. Well, now we've gone back and updated the 1547 requirements so that DER can actively participate in maintaining grid stability. And I think that eventually these things will migrate together, meaning how we program distributed generators will just be very similar to how the transmission connected generation is um, required to act because we won't really know in the future if, if we have systems that are predominantly transmission generation or distribution generation, they all need to act in a way to maintain operational grid stability. Okay, okay. and this next one is uh, kind of related to that too, Ben. Frequency shift trip and rock off limits have had to be reset on distribution connected inverters paid for by SOs or system operators in some cases. How does grid forming deal with this? Um, well, it uh, it is going to have those probably grid forming inverters are still going to have those kind of protective functions in them, meaning they are still going to monitor frequency and decide on making a decision to trip or not trip based on those requirements. The bigger challenge is what do, what do those requirements actually need to be? And this is why you're seeing um, system operators evaluate those rules and the impacts of having those rules the way they are. Um, if they have high enough levels uh, set, say, to trip on a specific rock off, then that's where they would have a, a potentially a big contingency. So they're having to go back and change those settings to, to make sure the units don't trip off. Now, grid forming inverters, for the most part, when you think about how they operate, they, even when they're connected to the grid and they are operating in a grid forming mode, meaning they're a voltage source, they still are going to have to pay attention to what's happening on the grid and follow uh, protective relaying. But the challenge there is just, do you have to change what type of protective relaying settings you're using um, to main, make sure that they don't trip offline? Okay, I'm going to jump down here and uh, take a software question because we discussed a lot of hardware questions here. How significant are computational constraints on running EMT stability models? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. We definitely are pushing the limit right now on running an EMT simulation on very large scale grids. So I think um, maybe even an ESIG uh, presentation or uh, one of our Unify presentation seminars recently talked about the fact that um, a group, um, I think led by Electronics in Canada, has been doing a full EMT model of the island of Maui. Um, and even that, when they run it, it takes 
several hours to run an EMT simulation of a very small power grid. So if you were to think about, well, if you wanted to run that for the ERCOT system or the Western Interconnect, really we don't have it, have set up the computational power necessary to run EMT for extended periods of time on such a large complex grid. So there definitely are, are challenges with doing those types of systems. We'd love to find ways um, to not have to always do EMT simulations to understand the operational characteristics of the inverters. But at some level, you're going to have to do some of those types of simulations. Maybe we're going to have to develop an EMT accelerator consortium then. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. If we want to do the whole Eastern interconnect, definitely. <laughs> uh, let me take one more software question just to give them a little bit of equal time. Um, how do proprietary black box vendor models fit into your interoperability framework? Yeah, so what we want to do is actually come up with a set of specifications that we don't need to know what is the control code operating inside the inverters. We just need them to react a certain way so that the um, reaction of the inverters to a variety of grid events is very well known and understood. That way you don't have to get into the proprietary controls that vendors are going to have in there. We know they're going to have them in there. Uh, that's always going to be the case. No, they're, they're not very open to releasing those, and we don't really want, don't think that that's the place we want to get to. We want to make sure that when we say that the, that the inverters need to be able to respond in a certain way, that they accurately are able to detect those conditions and accurately respond to them at the, at the system level. Okay. All right, so we're just a, a little past the top of the hour. I think we're going to need to wrap it up. And I, I want to thank Ben for this really informative presentation to help us get oriented on the unified project. And I'm really looking forward to the results that are going to be coming out over the next five years. As I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the video file has been posted and we'll answer the questions we didn't get to and get them posted as quickly as possible. We appreciate your engagement and look forward to seeing you again soon. On March 30th, we'll feature a joint GPST eSIG webinar on a DER marketplace demonstration project presented by the Australian grid operator, AMO, to which everyone is welcome. For those of you who can't wait until then, I invite you to join us in Tucson the week of March 21 for our spring technical workshop. Further information on all the webinars and meetings can be found on our website at esig.energy under events and in our newsletters and informational emails, and you're all invited to attend. Ben, Thank you once again for this very timely and informative webinar, and thank all of you for your interest. We look forward to seeing you again in the near future. In the meantime, everyone, take care, stay safe, and thanks for your participation. See you soon.